Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life. Come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Kelsey, I'll turn it back over to you to introduce our wonderful speaker this evening. Great. Thank you so much, Father Hezekiah. A native of England, Joseph Pierce is director of book publishing at the Augustine Institute and editor of the St. Austin Review editor of Faith and Culture, series editor of the Ignatius Critical Editions, senior instructor with Homeschool Connections, and senior contributor at the Imaginative Conservative. His personal website is jpierce.co. The internationally acclaimed author of many books, which include bestsellers such as The Quest for Shakespeare, Tolkien, Man and Myth, and The Unmasking of Oscar Wilde, Joseph Pierce is a world-recognized biographer of modern Christian literary figures. His books have been published and translated into Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, Italian, Korean, Mandarin, Croatian, and Polish. Pierce has hosted two 13-part television series about Shakespeare on EWTN and has also written and presented documentaries on EWTN on the Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. He has participated and lectured at a wide variety of international and literary events at major colleges and universities across the world, including the United States, Canada, Britain, Europe, Africa, and South America. And of course, he's a favorite lecturer here at the Institute of Catholic Culture. So please join me in welcoming back Joseph Pierce. Well, everybody, uh, this, this begins our, uh, the first of our three sessions on Bride's Head Revisited, which I actually um, personally believe is the finest novel of the 20th century. Of course, I've not read every one of the fine novels of the 20th century, so uh, this is a, a, a subjective judgment based upon my reading, but I have read an awful lot of books uh, from the 20th century, and I've not read any which is better than this. So, Bright Head Revisited by Evening War, I'm going to say a few things uh, about, um, uh, about the book in a general sense, um, and then we're going to dive into the text. So, what we're reading here actually is the second edition, um, so uh, which came out at the end of the 1950s. Um, and the, there's a few changes, uh, but no, nothing really major or drastic. The, the biggest one is something, should we some, some something structural, because the first uh, edition was published in 1945, and there were only actually a book one and book two. There was, there was uh, Et in Arcadia Ego book one and a Twitch upon the Thread book two. So. Uh, book two, uh, the Twitter from the Fed is now book three in the second edition, and there's a new book two called Bryce Said Deserted. Does not mean that the middle part of the book is new, <laughs> just means that uh, he's decided to just divide the text into three parts instead of two. Um, personally speaking, I prefer the original because structurally, what happens with Bryce Said Revisited is that. Um, the tide goes out in the first half of the book and the major protagonists are moving further and further away from Christ. And in the second part of the book, the tide comes in, the twitch upon the thread, pulling them back. And we see that, that the, the, many of the key characters getting closer and closer to Christ. So you have this, um, well, actually, <laughs> As Father said, uh, um, Exitus and Veditus, right? Uh, going out, coming back. That's exactly what this book does. And it still does it. But uh, putting the, the, the second, the middle section in sort of maybe takes something from that. The other thing um, I, I would say is the title. You know, the, 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 the symbolism of the title should not be uh, missed. Uh, Bride's Head. There's no place for Bride said, even in War's invented this. It's his own imaginations come up with this as the name of this uh, this uh, manor house, uh, this aristocratic abode. And of course, what is the bride's head, or who is the bride's head? The bride's head is the bridegroom. Okay, so so immediately we have uh, something which is ecclesiological here. 
because the bridegroom, of course, is Christ. And so there's some sense in which bride's head is symbolic of the bridegroom, Christ, and by extension, ecclesiologically, the mystical body of Christ, the church. Okay, so um, that's something I want you to be bearing in mind because there's this metaphysical, uh, spiritual aspect of this novel that if we don't keep it in mind at all times, we miss so much. So, um, uh, the one thing I want to say, by the way, I would invite you, I might even prompt questions because I have so much I want to cover in the time I have during the lecture portion. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to resist the temptation to throw out questions in the, in, in the midst of things because um, uh, uh, that, that, that will slow things, that, slow things up. But I, I'm going to suggest questions and I would like you perhaps to, to take the, uh, the, the prompting and, and, and ask them during the, uh, the 30 to 40 minutes Q&A we'll have uh, afterwards. So um, one thing that's good about this second edition is the preface to the second edition, which is not in. The first edition and, and and in the very first paragraph of this and this is on well it's not numbered here um anyway it's just before the text starts <laughs> maybe it's not a numbered page it's the preface um and the first paragraph there's actually the second sentence of the preface its theme so the theme of the novel the operation of divine grace on a group of diverse but closely connected characters was perhaps presumptuously large, but I make no apology for it. So we didn't have this, you know, if you were around when this book was first published in 1945, we did not have this statement, this candid statement of the author's intention and theme. Uh, we had to wait for the preface to the second edition, which we're reading for this. Um, so when I actually teach from the first edition, I always make a point of reading the preface to the second to set the scene. So what's important about this is basically the central main protagonist of the novel is not the narrator, Charles Ryder. It's not Sebastian or Julia or Brideshead or any of the other characters. It's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and the promptings of providence. In other words, there's a network of grace that's going on here. There's, there, there is the, the, uh, the presence of, of Christ providentially within the lives of all the characters and within their relationships with each other. And if we miss that invisible hand of the invisible protagonist of the novel, we are reading it on a level which is beneath it, because this, this novel works on the basis of the spiritual presence of Christ. And if we, we're not keeping that spiritual presence in mind at all times, we're missing what Evening War is doing with this novel. All right, so uh, let's move on from there. And just so th th that's one thing I want you to be keeping in mind of every single page we touch upon here, the spiritual dimension of the presence of Christ providentially within the story. The other thing I want to keep, you, uh, uh, keep in mind is when I teach this at undergraduate level, my favorite um, paper prompt uh, is, is, is the following. Um, Lady Marshmay, innocent or guilty, question mark. And then in the paper, you have to give the case for the prosecution and the case for the defense, and then act as the judge, summing up the evidence and giving your verdict. Um, because I do think also that one way that we um, are called to understand this novel is through the character of Lady Marshmaine, who she is, what she does, what she says, and crucially, what other people say about her. And to distinguish between what she says and what she does from what other people say that she does or say that she says. So, um, and, and make judgments based upon, as, as you would in a court of law, right? So I want you to be keeping that in mind. And she doesn't even appear all that much at first. Um, all right. So let's go, we go from the, from the preface to the prologue. And the prologue is written by someone who is, um, and it says at the bottom of page five here, that last full paragraph, 
here at the age of 39, I began to be old. So we have someone, you know, I spent a long time since I was 39. <laughs> so obviously I've begun to be old a long while ago. Um, but but, but the, the, the key thing is here is that Charles Ryder is a middle-aged man who feels older perhaps than he is, uh, feeling somewhat jaded and disillusioned with, with much of his life. Uh, but, but this is the narrative voice. So the other key thing we have to be aware of here is the, the critical distance between Charles Ryder, the middle-aged narrator, and the Charles Ryder uh, about whom he is narrating, right? So the young Charles and the slightly older Charles bring it up to just a few years prior to the, 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 narrate, the narrative voice here. So there is a very dis important and dis definite distance between the narrative voice of the older Charles and the Charles about whom he's speaking, okay? So that's important to keep in mind. Um, there's a mention on the page four of the Municipal Lunatic Asylum, and immediately below that, about eight lines up from the bottom of that, we, 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 we're introduced to Hooper for the first time, my newest joint platoon commander, and he grudged them, that's the lunatics, the insane in the insane asylum, their life of privilege. Hitler would put them in a gas chamber, he said. I reckon we can learn a thing or two from him. Hooper only appears in the preface, sorry, in the prologue and in the epilogue. He's not part of the main story, but he's uh, important as a scene setter. This novel is written uh, in the shadow of uh, the wasteland uh, 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 that, that preceded World War I. So T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, sort of set the scene for this disillusionment, uh, but also uh, disillusionment with modernity, but also an openness to conversion. T.S. Eliot, of course, becomes an Anglo-Catholic in 1928, and uh, Evening War becomes a Roman Catholic two years later. Uh, largely, or at least partly, due to T.S. Eliot's influence. Eliot is a significant influence on war. Um, one of War's, my, my favourite of Evening War's pre-World War II novels is, uh, is um, A Handful of Dust. Uh, and, and that novel takes its title from a line from uh, The Wasteland. I will show you fear in a handful of dust, which is a memento mori, a reminder of death in that poem, and always in, in Christian uh, symbolism, in literature and art, the memento mori, the reminder of death, is a reminder of the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So it's true in, 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 in that line, a handful of dust from the wasteland, through the title of uh, War's novel, a handful of dust, and it's true in the title of part one of this novel, Et in Arcadia Ego, I also lived in this... Uh, sort of Edenic paradise, but uh, it's past tense, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment about how that's a memento mori. But here, so Hooper, on the other hand, represents a hollow man. So one of Eliot's other poems from, from, from the 1920s was called The Hollow Men. And it's the idea that modern man ha has uh, no head, no mind, no, 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 uh, no uh, rootedness in, in, in civilization, in the heritage of Christendom or the heritage of, of the West. Um, so Hooper is, is, a, is a hollow man. At the same time that war is writing, Bryce had revisited, C.S. Lewis is writing The Abolition of Man. And he, in that uh, book, he talks about men without chests. They're hollow men, all right? So, so what, what um, uh, War is doing here in Hooper is 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 introducing a type uh, that we also see, for instance, in Rex Mottram is another example of a hollow man within the novel itself. But see how this person who's got no roots can sympathise with eugenics, with putting to death the uh, those who have no use to society, such as those in an insane asylum. Best thing for them is to put them in a gas chamber. Of course, that's shocking, bearing in mind he's in the army fighting Hitler uh, at the time he's saying this. But uh, so we, we, we we're learning something here about um, uh, about the, about modernity, about the hollow men. 
Um, so we have the disillusionment, and there's, there's lovely, um, there's, there's, there's this lovely metaphor I'm not going to read because I know we don't have time. Uh, the way that he talks about here, you know, my last love died, and we think he's talking about, you know, uh, his marriage, and he uses the metaphor of marriage. Uh, and then if we find out at the end of all this, sort of some like bathos, you know, fall to, fall to the absurd. Uh, I knew it all, the whole drab compass of marital disillusion. We had been through it together, the army and I. From the first importunate courtship until now, when nothing remained to us except the chill bonds of law and duty and custom. So he's a man who's disillusioned with the army. He's disillusioned with with, with the great. He's disillusioned with, with modernity, with Hooper. So uh, let's move on to the same theme, page nine. Hooper had no illusions about the army. It's the middle of the page, or rather, no special illusions distinguishable from the general enveloping fog from which he observed the universe. He has no sense of reality because he has no sense of realism in terms of philosophy. So at the age, skip a few lines, at the age when my eyes were dry to all save poetry. So when he when when, when Charles was young, you know, the, 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 the he he the one thing that moved him to tears was poetry. And then Hoop had wept often, but never for Henry's speech on St. Crispin's Day, so Henry V, nor for the epitaph at Thermopylae. The history they taught him had had few battles in it, but instead a profusion of detail about humane legislation and recent industrial change. Gallipoli, World War I, Balaclava, Crimean War, Quebec, obviously the war in Canada between the British and the French, Lepanto, 1571, Christian fleet against the, uh, um, against the Muslims, Bannockburn, Scots versus the English, or the Scots won that one. Once fall, um, uh, that's the, the subject, of course, the Song of Roland. Charlemagne's forces being ambushed as they crossed the Pyrenees, Marathon going back to pre-Christian times. These and the back in the West where Arthur fell, so the whole Arthurian legends, and a hundred such names whose trumpet notes, even now in my seer and lawless state, called to me irresistibly across the intervening years with all the clarity and strength of boyhood sounded in vain to Hooper. He was never taught any of this, none of this heritage of Western history, Western civilization, Western poetry, Western literature is known to him. What he knows about, next paragraph, uh, is the army passed by the use of man hours. They couldn't get away with that in business. So he understands man hours, he understands economics, sociology, and the, the test of all truth is business. Is the economy, and then what does uh, where does where does uh, and this, again this is important because this is the voice that speaks through the novel. We need to know something about the the older Charles Ryder. So middle of page ten, in the weeks that we were together, Hooper began a symbol to, became a symbol to me of young England. So that whenever I read some public utterance proclaiming what youth demanded in the future and um, what the world owed to youth, I would test these general statements by substituting Hooper and seeing if they still seemed as plausible. Thus, in the dark hour before the valley, I sometimes pondered Hooper rallies, Hooper hostels, international Hooper cooperation, and the religion of Hooper. He was the acid test of all these alloys. So here we see how the middle aged Charles is completely and utterly disillusioned, not just with the army, but with the spirit of modernity and certainly the spirit of futurity or progressivism that somehow or other, because the youth are younger than older people, therefore somehow they have some truth that older people don't have. Whereas, of course, that's a, an inversion and a reversal of everything in history where you look up to your elders because they have more experience. And not just the elders that are alive, but the elders that are hundreds of years old. That's the whole point of be being knowledgeable about uh, that two and a half, three thousand years of history, because we've got three thousand years of experience to draw on, right? Not 13 years of experience or 16 years. So let's move on. Um, at the end of the, the prologue here, he, the, the magic word, 
widespread uh, is uh, is mentioned, uh, and um, that changes everything. So what's this place called? He asks. He told me, this is the bottom of page 16. He told me, and on the instant, it was as though someone had switched off the wireless, turned, tuned out modernity, and a voice that had been bawling in my ears incessantly, fatuously, for days beyond number, had been suddenly cut short. An immense silence followed, empty at first, but gradually, as my outraged sense regained authority, full of a multitude of sweet and natural and long forgotten sounds. For he had spoken a name that was so familiar to me, a conjurer's name of such ancient power, that at its mere sound, the phantoms of those haunted late years began to take flight. So uh, first of all, of course, the magic word is bride's head. That's all it took mention of the one word and i like to see a shakespearean type pun there uh in uh the the the, uh, the phantoms of those haunted late years began to take flight as an f-l-y-t-e whether that's intentional or not, i do not know and then he imagined how it used to be and uh, beautiful prose I, I don't have time to read it because we don't have time but bottom of the page there did the fellow dear graze here still Unless the eye wander aimlessly, a Doric temple stood by the water's edge, etc., etc. Just beautiful. And then Hooper, uh, the, just at the end here, and a queer thing, says Hooper, there's a sort of RC church attached. I looked in and there was a kind of service going on. Just a padre and one old man. I felt very awkward, more in your line than mine. Well, that's significant because the, the Charles, the younger Charles, we're about to meet certainly would not have been the least bit interested in uh, the, uh, an RC church, would not know what was going on in there. So something has changed, that's the first hint. Okay, let's now get into uh, the historic part of the novel when but Charles is now going to recount the past et in Arcadia Ego. And I was also in this idyllic pastoral setting, right? but it's something which has passed away. The whole point about Arcadia, it's like, you know, something beautiful like Eden, uh, a pastoral paradise, a perfection, a place of innocence that has passed away. And we're looking back on it from a, from a perspective of exile. We also see the significance of it specifically as a motif within this novel when we get to it. And I'm going to read this, even though I know we don't have lots of time, not only because it's beautiful prose, but it's, it's saying something very important. He's setting the scenes seen here. It's Oxford in 1923, just after World War I. Second paragraph. That day, too, I had come not knowing my destination. It was eighth week. That's that that's uh, rowing uh, cruise of eight on, 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 on the Thames. Oxford, submerged now and obliterated. Irrecoverable as Leoness, so quickly have the waters come flooding in. So here we have Oxford, perhaps as Arcadia, right? The Oxford that was, but is no more. Oxford in those days was still a city of aquatint. In her spacious and quiet streets, men walked and spoke as they had done in Newman's day. Her autumnal mists, her grey springtime, and the rare glory of her summer days, such as that day when the chestnut was in flower and the bells rang out high and clear over her gables and cupolas, exhaled the soft airs of centuries of youth. It was this forceful hush which gave our laughter its resonance and carried it still joyously over the intervening clamour. So few things here. The Oxfords basically men walked and spoke as they had done in Newman's day. So John Henry Newman and the Oxford movement was in its at its height in the 1830s. Newman was still around in the 1840s, was received with the Catholic Church in 1845. So we are talking about 90 years earlier than uh, when the young Charles Ryder is there. Uh, but nothing much has changed. Um, that really, that, that 
Oxford is a place where there is the presence of tradition. And one thing about tradition is it puts the brakes on time. It slows down time. The poet Roy Campbell used the metaphor of society, saying that, that, that society is like a car. He says, the steering wheel is wisdom, the accelerator is progress, and tradition is the brakes. Uh, so if you live in a society such as we do, which, which has thrown away the steering wheel, <laughs> refuses to use the brakes, uh, and has its foot down hard on the accelerator, I think we know where that's going to end up. But the point about tradition, it slows things down. Um, I think there's one other thing I was going to say. Yeah, so this, the, uh, this wonderful phrase, well, exhale the soft airs of centuries of youth. Think about that. It's a different sort of youth from Ho Hooper. It's uh, young people uh, going to Oxford to learn about the, the Western heritage, the liberal arts, of the roots of, of Christendom and of civilization, generation after generation after generation. Back in the 1990s, I was, I was uh, uh, the resident tutor at a summer program at Brazenow College, Oxford. And I had a little tiny room up a spiral staircase, thick stone walls, and this uh, Brazenow College, I think, dates back to the 14th or 15th century. Um, and as I was in there, I was thinking that, that there have been 600 years of youth sleeping in this room young people about 19 20 years old each staying about three years and the next one comes along so that's 30 or 40 every single century um it's uh well it's a it's, it's a powerful palpitating thought and that's what uh war is, is talking about here but then go to the bottom of page 22 the lunch the porter at the at the at the college but this was 1923, and for Lunt, as for thousands of others, things could never be the same as they had been in 1914. In other words, World War I, 1914 to 1918, had destroyed the last vestiges of the old world. Certainly it destroyed the British Empire. Uh, there were things much older than the British Empire, of course. But so on the, the, on the one hand, the younger generation are disillusioned with the whole conservative, for want of a better word, the whole traditional thing. But for those who are older, everything's just come crashing down because of the war. A place of desolation, a wasteland. Let's move on to page 28. Something that is a very powerful, very important for you to know if you're going to understand literature. You have to read literature with your antennae twitching. Uh, and your antennae are, 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 have to have certain functions. And the most important is allegorical. To what extent is this work that I'm reading saying things beyond the work itself? To what, point, to what extent is it signifying something beyond itself? Well, one way that writers do this is through something which is called intertextuality, where a, a writer will use, uh, reference other texts to deepen his own text. And insofar as the reader knows those other texts and what they signify, they can be taken deeper. So the whole, the whole, yeah, basically just about well, the vast bulk of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland is intertextual. It's allusions to different works all the time. And insofar as you understand those works, in other, in other words, insofar as you're part of the heritage of Western civilization that the T.S. said it's drawing from, the deeper you can go into that poem. Insofar as you're ignorant, you can only scratch the surface. Well, War does the same here, thing here on page 28. Two thirds of the way down. My books were meager and commonplace. Roger Fry's Vision and Design, the Medici Press edition of a Shropshire lad, eminent Victorians, some volumes of Georgian poetry, Sinister Street, and South Wind. Well, these are, first of all, very contemporary. So he has, so the, we're learning immediately that uh, Charles has no real rootedness, uh, apart from obviously that, that poetry we know he's learned off in school. But what he's reading now is, is none of that. He's turned his back on that. And a lot of these are, are, are writers from the Bloomsbury group. And you have to understand what the Bloomsbury Group was. It was a uh, it was a, 
uh, for the most part, atheistic, sexually androgynous, shall we say, um, uh, iconoclastic morally, um, anti-Christian. So for instance, one of the leaders of the Bloomsbury group was Virginia Woolf. And when she heard of T.S. Eliot's uh, conversion, and T.S. Eliot was you know, a friend of Virginia Woolf and, and, and her friends, uh, and she said, dear Tom Eliot can be considered dead to us now. There's something obscene in this day and age of someone sitting by the fire and believing in God. So that's the spirit of the Bloomsbury Group. And these, this is exactly what he's reading. The Medici Press is the publishing house of the Bloomsbury Group. Roger Fry is a member of the Bloomsbury Group. Um, uh, Eminent Victorians was uh, written by Lytton Strachey. It was a, a whole new genre of hackiography, the opposite of hagiography, uh, where you, the, the purpose is to hack to pieces the reputation of the person about whom you're writing. So it, it's Lytton Strachey basically ripping to pieces uh, the, 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 the iconic figures of the, of the previous century. And then the Georgian poetry, so that's contemporary poetry. Sinister Streets, a novel actually by, by um, Compton Mackenzie, who would actually be a convert to Catholicism subsequently. But this gives us some idea. And then we, 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 meet, uh, we meet Sebastian for the first time, not very propitious circumstances because he, is, uh, he vomits through the window uh, of Charles's room, not a promising way to start a relationship. Um, but we learned something about Sebastian. And by the way, the reason we'll be spending more time in these early, early pages, we will be can speed up in, in, in the second se session, is that this lays foundations. You know, who are the characters? We need to know who the people are that we're dealing with. And in the first part of the book, that uh, the war um, shows us, uh, tells us about these people. So here we learn valuable insight about Sebastian. It was, it was not middle of page 29. It was not until Sebastian idly turned the page of Clive Bell's art. So Clive Bell's another, another member of the Bloomsbury group. Uh, and he reads from Clive Bell's art. Does anyone feel the same kind of emotion for a butterfly or a flower that he feels for a cathedral or a picture? End quote. Yes, I do. And then that opens Charles' eyes to some, a facet of Sebastian that he hadn't realized before. Um, and, and basically, Sebastian is, in his philosophy, anti-decadent. So in other words, he's not comfortable with the Bloomsbury group. And he's a romantic. And in other words, with romantics, you say we, we, we can come to truth through the beauty of nature by, by looking at a butterfly, by looking at a mountain, by looking at a tree. Whereas the for the decadence, it was about artificiality. It's about what human beings make. So something made by a person, a work of art, a work of sub-creation, as Tolkien would say, such as a cathedral or, or a painting, uh, is going to move us more than a work of God's own primal creation, such as a, a mountain in the Alps or that bank of trees I can see out the window there. Well, Sebastian is on the side of God <laughs> in this, He's on the side of the Romantics against this artificiality of the decadent Bloomsbury's. We hear much more about, about Sebastian. He is somewhat strange. He carries his teddy bear around with him all the time. Uh, and it's significant. We're looking for symbolism here. His teddy bear's name is Aloysius. Now, Sebastian is a Catholic. So that's uh, the teddy bear's Christian name. Named after a saint, Saint, Al saint Aloysius Gonzaga. Uh, a Jesuit, and he is the patron saint of youth. And of course, the teddy bear is itself a symbol of the fact that Sebastian can't let go of his childhood, but right? he's refusing to grow up. He's not being childlike, which is good. He's being obstinately childish. And as Paul says, uh, we need to put away childish things when we grow up, and, he, and, and, and Sebastian won't do that. But it's very interesting that, that, that Aloysius Gonzaga, the patron saint of youth, wrote the following. I am a piece of twisted iron. I entered religion to get twisted straight. So one of the 
key elements in this uh, is talked about at some point. You know, did Sebastian have a calling for the priesthood, which he refused to answer? Bride said, thinks he does. Uh, uh, thought he did. Um, Sebastian's always been in denial of it, but, you know, certainly Sebastian is a piece of twisted iron. Um, should he have done what St. Aloysius Gonzaga did and entered religion to get twisted straight? Certainly interesting symbolic connection there. Um, let's move on because we need to. We're, we're page 34. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, the very, very good early 1980s British television adaptation of Bryce Said Revisited. Uh, it's about 13 hours long or something. It's marvelous. As distinct from the very, relatively recent Hollywood version, which is horrible, uh, and in which the producer said that in his version of Bryce Said, God is the enemy. That's probably all you need to know. Um, but certainly that the British TV one. But anyway, the, the this particular scene I'm going to read now as it's done uh, in, in that British TV adaptation is, is very good. So this is Anthony Blanche, uh, uh, the aesthete, so that's inverted commas, so an aesthete's right, the aesthetic movement. Oscar Wilde was the godfather of the aesthetes uh, 20 years before this, uh, 30 years before this, um, 40 years before this. Uh, he, but he was the SD post, a byword of iniquity from Sherwell Edge to Somerville. So basically from one end of Oxford to the other. He's a byword of iniquity. Uh, and it's a wonderful description of him. Uh, he had been pointed out to me often in the streets as he pranced along with his high peacock tread. I just, it just gets your imagination, uh, a man walking with a high peacock tread. Um, but then we see, so he meets him through Sebastian. Uh, and then he goes to the balcony and there's all these jocks, all these athletes on their way to the river to watch the, you know, the rowing. Uh, and then in languishing tones, recited passages from the wasteland. So more intertextuality here. To the sweated and muffled throng that was on its way to the river. I'm not, I'm not going to try to do an, an, an effete Ant, Anthony Blanche um, rendition, you'll be pleased to know. Um, uh, I, Tiresias, have forsuffered suffered all, he sobbed to them from the Venetian arches. So he's doing this from a megaphone. Enacted on this same d divan or bed, I who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead. So there's intertextually here, 1923, it's only a year after The Wasteland's published. Most people believe The Wasteland was decadent, iconoclastic, opposed to civilization. They misread it. They misread T.S. Eliot. He was using a fragmented new form. So it's certainly new in terms of avant-garde in terms of form, but the fragmentation was a means of showing the fragmentation of modernity that can make no connections to anything anymore, just had broken pieces, fragments. Um, but here, this particular part of the poem uh, is, is met by Tiresias. And one thing about Tiresias is his, his sexuality is, uh, is um, uh, ambiguous, um, not because he's, uh, 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 what's the word, transsexual, but because of the mythology surrounding him, he was turned from a man into a woman but men, but by the gods. So, but the point is he represents both, but so for, for Anthony Blanche, perhaps this is appropriate, right? But he also is an everyman figure and not just in an everyman in an inclusive sense, as in every man and every woman figure. Um, and in, 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 Greek, in Greek literature, such as the Odyssey and in um, uh, uh, Oedipus Rex, um, Tiresias is, is the blind prophet. The one who, although he physically can't see, because of his wisdom, spiritually he sees and understands in terms of prophecy much more than those who have eyes. 
So he's foresuffered all. He has seen for hundreds of years, since the time of Greece to the time of 1923, this same pathetic scene. And then what he's talking about here is the scene, if you know the poem, of the typist who comes home from work um, and uh, she feels that it's about time because she's a modern girl that she lost her virginity. So she gives her away really cheaply to a young man Carbuncular, who basically he just wants to get the pleasure of the moment. Uh, he, he, he gives her a patronizing kiss and disappears. And she says, well, thank God that's over. Um, uh, just the rite of passage that was necessary. It's all so pathetic. And this is what's been talked about here. All right, so uh, Theresius, the, 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 the blind prophet who sees, sees this same scene in every generation from ancient Greece to the young typist in Eliot's poem. Um, the sordidness of lust, um, etc. I would going to mention Nanny Hawkins in passing, but we need to move on because we, we need to cover ground here. Nanny Hawkins is very, very um, simple soul and very holy, but she knows nothing about uh, those who aren't. Or actually has a, a holy naivete. So on page 38, I'm going to read this, not so much because of Annie Hawkins, because what it shows of um, was masterful control of character development in absentia. In other words, he allows us to understand a great deal about characters before we've even met them through, think, through passing conversations. So here, are you studying hard at your books, says Nanny Hawkins, what clearly doesn't know Sebastian, who obviously isn't. Not very, I'm afraid, Nanny. Ah, cricketing all day long, I expect, like your brother. Of course, he has to also know what he's doing. Um, well, let's move down a little bit. Did you see that this piece about Julia in the paper? She brought it down for me. Not that it's nearly good enough of her, but what it says is very nice. Quote, the lovely daughter whom Lady Marshman is bringing out this season, witty as well as ornamental, the most popular debutante, end quote. Well, that's no more than the truth, though it was a shame to cut her hair. Such a lovely head of hair she had, just like her ladyship's. I said to Father Phipps, it's not natural. He said, nuns do it. And I said, well, surely, Father, you aren't going to make a nun of Lady Julia, the very idea. All right, so just a few words by an old lady who doesn't play a, very, a, a central role, an important role, not a central role, tells us something. So Julia's just come out. She's a, she's a debutante. She's come of age. Um, she, um, however, she's beautiful, but she's cut her hair to the, what is very fashionable in the 1920s, short hair, the Charleston, the flappers, they were called, right? These, so for late Nanny Hawkins, none of this makes sense, right? Why would she cut her beautiful long hair? Because it, because Julia's a slave of fashion. Um, and when Father Phipps said, well, nuns have short hair. And then you know, even Nanny Hawkins, who doesn't know that Sebastian doesn't play cricket and doesn't study hard at his books, knows that Julia is never going to be a nun, all right? So, so we've learned a great deal here, right? In, in just a, a casual conversation about an old lady. War is brilliant at this. So he said, and then Sebastian X. Pay says, poor Nanny, um, you know, she lives such a dull life. In fact, Nanny Hawkins is probably very happy up there in, in, in a garret room at the top, but, uh, I'd take a, a good mind to bring her to Oxford to live with me, only she'd be always be trying to send me to church. <laughs> uh, she loves her dearly, but of course she takes the whole religion thing a bit too seriously. Um, and then we, then we have to leave before Julia gets back, and Charles says, which are you ashamed of, her or me? I'm ashamed of myself. And this is a recurring motif, which we see, I might have time to read them all, um, uh, of Sebastian's self-loathing, right? He he knows what he should be, and yet he doesn't seem to be able or doesn't seem to desire to be what he knows he should be. And this makes him miserable uh, and, and full of uh, uh, self-loathing. So let me see the chapel of Bride's Head. Um, and as they go in, Sebastian dipped his finger in the water stoop, crossed himself and genuflected. I copied him. This is the bottom of page 14. Why do you do that, he asked Frosty. Just good manners. 
So, uh, uh, and then that actually, why, why Sebastian irritated, doesn't want Charles to get religion, right? Um, Charles is one of the one of the ways by which he's escaping from his religion. So it irritates him when he sees uh, Charles uh, crossing himself and genuflecting. But why is Charles doing it? Not because he's religious, just good manners. And that, speaking as an Englishman, I sometimes say that um, uh, that the English uh, uh, have abandoned the Ten Commandments and have retained only one sacrosanct commandment that must be obeyed. Thou shalt not be impolite. Well, here's Charles being a good Englishman, right? Just good manners. Um, all right, move on. Chapter two, my cousin Jasper. Uh, so he's very sort of conservative in his morals. Um, so again, we hear more about the characters, character development in absentia, but from different characters. This is so this is his cousin Jasper, who's no friend of Catholicism, page 44. The Marsh Mays have lived apart since the war, you know, an extraordinary thing. Everyone thought they were a devoted couple. Then he went off to France with his yeomanry and just never came back. It was as if he'd been killed. She's a Roman Catholic, so she can't get a divorce or won't, I expect. You can do anything at Rome with money and they're enormously rich. Flight. May be all right, but Anthony Blanche. Now there's a man there's absolutely no excuse for. So here we get the sort of the conservative moral attitude to the various characters and to Catholicism. But look, so Lord Marshman went off to fight in World War I and never returned, not because he was killed, but because he had escaped from his wife uh, and his marriage and his family. Um, and now we have the, uh, the motif et in Arcadia Ego, so we do have to talk about this before we move on. So halfway down page 45, he's thinking, about, you know, have you paid for those, you paid for those, and have you paid for this, or that peculiarly noisome object, his cousin Jasper speaking, a human skull lately purchased from the School of Edison, which, resting in a bowl of roses, formed at the moment the chief decoration of my table, it bore the motto et in Arcadia Ego inscribed on its forehead, on its forehead. All right, so now we see that the juxtaposition of the human skull um, in a bowl of roses, right? So what roses bloom and then fade and die away, right? So the roses represent each individual generation that's going to pass away. The one thing that remains is death, the skull. And with the motto et in Arcadia ego. So the roses were also in Arcadia, but the skull was once a rose. So it reminds me, and I'm sure this is deliberate, of, of, uh, of the, the scene, scene in Hamlet, of course, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. Um, so what does this juxtaposition of et in Arcadia ego, the title of book one, with the skull and the roses say about what was doing in part one of this novel. I'm going to end soon. Let's move on to page 63. At the bottom of page 63 here, this is Sebastian. You know, he's being noticed that he's misbehaving. I've been to mass at the old palace, he said. I haven't been all this term, so yes, obviously that's a mortal sin, and once in your bell asked me to dinner twice last week, and I know what that means, mummy's been writing to him. So I sat bang in front where he couldn't help seeing me and absolutely shouted the Hail Marys at the end. So that's over. How was dinner with Anthony? What do you talk about? So again, if this, you know, if, if we're only familiar with the Novus Ordo Mass, we won't actually know what's happening in that passage, because it's actually quite important. Um, uh, it means that Sebastian chose to go to the low Mass, in other words, to get it over with, right? He had to go to Mass, but he wasn't going to sit through, right, uh, uh, a sung Mass that could last an hour and a half. He wanted to sit through the one that's probably over in 40 minutes. And then the reason we know that is because at the low mass in the extraordinary form, not in the, the sung mass, 
At the end of Mass, the priest kneels before the altar and says with the congregation some prayers, beginning with three Hail Marys. So Sebastian sat at the front and made sure that his response to the second half of the Hail Mary was as loud as possible, just to make sure that Monsignor Bell knew that he was there to get his mother off his back. Well, that's the end of chapter two. Um, we, I think it might be a good time Good, good time to end because it's we've been going for, for over 50 minutes. Um, it'll leave us half an hour for questions. Um, I know we've only covered um, uh, 65 pages. I was hoping to cover maybe about 130, but we will we will pace ourselves as appropriate. Trust me. <laughs> that well, sounds thank great. you. And I'll hand things over. All right. I think that we have some questions coming in. So are you ready for? Q&A, Joseph Pierce. Oh, I am. Okay, great. Why don't we get started with Adrian? I saw that you um, have a question, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Could you just tease out a little bit about Cordelia and Julia? Because I find them very fascinating characters. Uh, yes, it's, it's a little bit difficult in some ways because, um, you know, I've only had the first of three classes and uh, I, I have to balance answering questions without sort of jumping the gun, uh, so to speak, or even possibly spoiling things if people are reading as we go rather than reading the whole thing. Um, but uh, all right, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let one cat out of the bag now as regards intertextuality. Um, uh, well, I, I actually... Um, uh, I might put you, uh, uh, Adrienne, uh, on the spot, if you don't mind. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't know the answer, but intertextually, we talk about intertextuality. When we first see Cordelia, um, uh, Charles and Sebastian, when they first meet her, are sunbathing naked on the roof of Brideshead. Now, I think they're decent. I, I, I mean, they're, they're, the, the important parts are covered, right? So it's not as if they're scandalizing the, the little girl because she's only a, uh, you know, she is only a girl at this point. Um, uh, but intertextually, what do you think is going on there? What might it mean? Um... I, don't, I don't want to see you squirm, so I'll give you a clue. I mean, where do we find the most famous Cordelia in all of literature? Oh, uh, King Lear. King Lear. Okay, and and the motif is such that's why the, that's why the theme of nudity is there, right? Because also the most famous nude in the whole literature is probably King Lear. Okay, when he strips naked on the heath. So the, so the fact that he that War chooses to call Cordelia Cordelia, it's not a very common name, it, it's a very famous name if you in, in Shakespearean terms. And the fact he then couples that with, uh, with the scene of nudity uh, suggests that it's not just a joke, it's that somehow or other we're meant to connect his Cordelia with Shakespeare's Cordelia. Uh, and that's important because, of course, in, in, in King Lear, if you know King Lear, that Cordelia is the is the daughter who stays true uh, to, to, to Christ, to the church, and to the good of her father. Uh, she's, she's loyal to, uh, to, to, to the love that, to which she should be obedient, even unto death, in her case, in, unto exile and ultimately death, all right? So Cordelia in, 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 in Brideshead is, is basically a, a, a young girl or a, a subsequently woman, who knows what her responsibility to Christ is, and she does it, as opposed to many of the other characters who might know what their responsibility is, but don't do it. So that's what I suggest that Cordelia is. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know whether this is just a, uh, a play on words, but Julia is flighty, okay? Uh, and that's what she is. I mean, but the thing about Julia and Sebastian is they, they want the best of both worlds. They want to be accepted in, in, in the secular world where their religion is unacceptable. Uh, but they also don't want to abandon their religion, not least because they both believe enough about it to think they probably will go to hell if they do. So they sort of believe it, but don't really want to. That's the, that's the conundrum that both of them are in. Thank you. 
my pleasure. Okay, we're getting a couple of questions, um, which I think is a good one to tackle here at the beginning, of people asking if you could explain some of the culture behind Oxford and how that might differ from our conception of what American college is like. Um, so someone was specifically asking about the different roles of porters, proctors, and wardens. Um, could you help explain um, like how, a little bit like how the classes worked and how it is that they're able to have hour long lunches in the middle of the, the day there. Um, and then also what it means, like how important it was to receive a degree from Oxford versus just having attended there. Okay, uh, great questions. I, the first thing I would say uh, in all candor, I have not attended Oxford. So uh, yeah, I cannot speak as an insider who uh, did my three years um, doing my undergraduate at, at Oxford College. Been at Oxford many times. I said I was a resident tutor at Brazenose College that, that one week, right? It's not three years. So I'm not an expert. But the key thing about Oxford is that it's actually very medieval, uh, even today, uh, even today, uh, in its structure. So it's actually, to use the language of the church's social teaching, is subsidiarist. So the university is doesn't is not uh, so it doesn't exist, but it's it, 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 it's an agreement. It's an it's an amorphous agreement between the colleges, uh, and the colleges are the autonomous things, uh, and uh, the colleges uh, agree that they will all uh, accept that the, a, a degree from any of these colleges is a a degree from Oxford. So the difficulty is a new college trying to get accepted as part of Oxford University. But the university itself as an institution is really just a legal entity. It's not a, it's not a body. You, no one goes to Oxford University, they go to Somerville College Oxford or New College Oxford and they get a degree from Oxford University. So, uh, I, I, and I think Oxford was um, founded in the Middle Ages. Um, so New College Oxford, I think, dates from the 1300s, uh, possibly the 1400s, and it's New College, right? Because they're not older ones. Um, so uh, it has its roots in, in, in the medieval and traditionally Oxford's been the most conservative, I don't like using the word conservative, traditional oriented um of of the in english uh universities so cambridge was the place where all the progressive stuff happened and cambridge was uh put its uh, emphasis upon um the sciences the physical sciences and was very much besotted with the enlightenment oxford was always the place that was skeptical about the enlightenment that they insisted on giving preeminence to the liberal arts and so for instance during the civil war the english civil war uh, when the Puritans um, uh, 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 took London, the capital of the King's England, until he was defeated, was Oxford, because that was the most staunchly tradition-oriented, royalist, non-Puritan part of the country. So there's something very tradition-oriented and at least culturally um, uh, medieval about Oxford University. It's that tradition-oriented aspect of it, I think, that War's in love with, and War was, um, um, oh, so what I'm looking for, uh, lamenting its passing, uh, as he saw it in the years be between the two world wars. I hope that helps a bit. I mean, I, I, I you know, the, the, the specific jobs of a proctor uh, and a warden, I'm sorry, that you need to ask someone else about that. Like almighty, almighty Google, for instance, will do a better job than me on that one. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's helpful context, I think. Um, okay, Catherine is writing in a question that I think many of us have. She asks, how do we understand Anthony Blanche? Is he sort of an inversion of the blind prophet? He has a way of seeing things that others don't, but he's so twisted. She says, every time I read this book, I feel like I come away with more questions about him. I recognize well that sentiment. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I don't think we should, because Anthony Blanche reads from the wasteland that he is Tiresias. He might think he is Tiresias. Um, that's not the same thing. Uh, I think more to the point, he loves what he 
things uh, the wasteland stands for. So in other words, what many people thought in 1923, this is iconoclastic, this is a, this is a new poetry, which is going to do away with all traditional uh, forms of poetry. That, that, in, in my book, Literary Converts, uh, there's a chapter called Poetry in Commotion, about literally, in, in the wake of the wasteland, in fact, before it, with Truth Rock even, T.S. Eliot basically caused a civil war uh, in, in, in terms of prosody, you know, what, what was poetry uh, from from the World War One right through to the, the end of the 1920s, this civil war going on. And, and you had the avant-garde, the so evening war was the, the head of that, people like Edith Sitwell. Um, but then you had the, 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 the traditionalists, so the conservatives, Chesterton, you know, did, you know uh, despised T.S. Eliot. Um, C.S. Lewis despised T.S. Eliot um, because they all thought that he was an iconoclastic, anti-Christian, uh, cancel culture person because of what he was doing to tradition. Uh, and they were wrong. <laughs> the poem was misread. Uh, and you know you can actually see, so when, let me very quickly, I don't want to go on a long tangent about the wasteland, but this is important because um, when Eliot becomes an Anglo-Catholic in 1928. He describes himself as um, a monarchist, a classicist, and a Catholic. His mentor, when he was at the Sorbonne in Paris, Jean Moraz, the leader of Action Française, described himself as Catholic, monarchic, uh, uh, and classicist. Right, so exactly the same thing. Uh, so and that was before, that was about 1914, long before he watched The Wasteland. So Eliot was all, he wasn't a Christian believer, but he was a wannabe Christian. And that's clear that when you read The Wasteland, this is someone that on the path to conversion. So the point is, what War's doing here is showing how The Wasteland was perceived in 1923. So the people like Anthony Blanche can proclaim it from the housetops or from the balcony with his megaphone to these conservative athletes um, as this is what's this is what's this is the future get used to it right but ironically what he quotes is from that scene where where Elliot shows the depravity and sordid shallowness and pointlessness of mo the modern attitude to sex with the scene the, with the episode of the typist which this these words from from Tiresias uh, are apart. So um, I think what War's doing is showing that um, Anthony Blanche uh, ironically does not know what he's talking about in that scene. But he certainly he's very perceptive about aesthetics. You know, he 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 he. But then he's very decadent, even in his tastes. I mean, when, when they, they, we don't have time to talk about it. When when he went out for dinner. Uh, you know, he's he's drinking all these ultra sweet, decadent cocktails. You know, Alexander uh, Brandy Alexanders and um, uh, what's the other one sit in there. But but uh, but he but he 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 deigns to order a Burgundy uh, because it, Charles would like it. So what's a Burgundy? It's traditional, centuries old French red wine. Well, that, none of that's fair. He wants all these new, ultra sweet, decadent cocktails. So, you know, is that good taste? <laughs> well, it depends upon your taste, I suppose, right? But I would, I would much rather have a glass of Burgundy over uh, Brandy Alexander any day of the week. Um, and uh, oh yeah, Brandy Alexander's like ice cream. Uh, uh, it's like uh, alcoholic ice cream. I suppose if you want to spike your ice cream, it's okay to have occasionally. But who'd want more than one, right? I hope that helps. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, let's take a question from someone on screen. Chad, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? Yes. Um, Joseph, can you please explain the uh, some of the homosexual undertones or maybe even overtones? It seemed to be uh, like that was intentional, but I'm not sure if I'm just reading it through like our, our pop culture today. That's a great question and a crucial one that needs to be discussed. And I probably would have got to it at some point, um, but it's not a central part of the novel. But I'm glad you've asked. So um, 
War is the best way I can answer it, first of all, is to talk about one of the heterosexual aspects of the of the novel, because I think it explains what he's doing with the homosexual aspects. He shows us how a good novelist should treat or deal with or handle sexual activity. And he shows us it brilliantly when uh, the, the Julia and Charles begin their begin their adulterous relationship. But some of the good things about these, this Q and A, by the way, if we are getting behind, I can just say we discussed that last week and just move on, uh, just quick summary and carry on. Um, uh, so uh, they're at uh, Julia's cabin uh, on the cruise, coming back on 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 the the, the ocean liner, coming back from the America to to England, and she just says yes now, and Charles goes into the uh, cabin with her. Um, and there's maybe a few sentences about you know, stormy ocean waves or something, but, but we are not invited into the cabin. We are not going to be a fly on the wall or a voyeur invited to watch. Unlike, by the way, the worst part of the British TV series, we have a, uh, a full frontal of the actress playing Julia, uh, her breasts for about 30 seconds, completely unnecessary. Um, uh, but that's not what war does. So in other words, war is coy and decorous uh and so uh he deliberately has written the book so that those who are not tuned into homosexuality are probably not going to detect it and even if they do detect it they're not going to be offended by it it's certainly not in your face um but there's certainly a suggestion of homosexuality, homosexuality, homosexuality. Anthony Blanche, absolutely, not obviously. The relationship between Charles and Sebastian, it's uh, it's heavily suggested, all right? Um, but again, we're never gonna be finding ourselves anywhere where we're gonna be affronted by seeing any physical activity between them. Uh, and um, uh, I, frankly, this is my view on this, uh, when I see Bryce said we visited in the gay fiction section of Barnes and Noble, I rejoice um, because people will buy it, presumably, um, looking for that aspect of it and will receive a great deal of stuff they weren't expecting. So, um, you know, uh, I have no problem. Obviously, homosexuality is part of the sexual picture uh, and it, it should not be excluded from novels. It's how you handle it, how you deal with it. And it certainly isn't glorified, it certainly isn't lionized. War is a very traditional oriented Catholic whose understanding uh, 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 of Christian, uh, of sexual morality uh, is, is, is the same as the churches. So, um, but I think he handles it magnificently. But, you know, we don't have to believe it's there. I, I, I think that those of us that have been around, it, it's, it's suggested, it's there under the surface but we are not going to be taken anywhere where it's going to offend us by seeing it in practice. All right. Thank you so much um, for that answer. We have two questions coming in on how the book was received. Um, so Mary asks, why do you think the book was so well received among non-Catholics as well as Catholics? And Kelly asks, why do you think that people are so drawn to the book, even when they completely miss the point of it. For example, you mentioned how some see God as the enemy in the book. Yeah, well, I think that um, to, to answer the last part of the question first, um, uh, that first of all, pride uh, precedes a fall, but pride also is married always to prejudice. Jane Austen is a good philosopher. Pride and prejudice go hand in hand, right? So um, if you have a pride agenda, you're going to read it for those aspects of it which which uh, titillate you. Not it's difficult. There's not much titillating in it, but um, that are suggestive. And you're going to try to airbrush out those elements of it or ignore those elements of it which you find offensive. In other words, the Christian elements. So that would explain why the the producer, you know, uh, wanted to 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 do that. Also, they want to destroy, diffuse. I mean, it's what's happening with Amazon's depiction of uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, that you, 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 you take something which is good, true and beautiful and you pervert, pervert it. Um, so uh, 
that's that's another aspect of it. As regards its reception, actual fact, there was a great deal of hostility to it when it came out, particularly from socialist critics and communist critics, because they saw it as a as an idolization or an idealization of the aristocracy, and that in itself, in, a, in a, within the spirit of class warfare, was uh, unacceptable. So, in actual fact, it took an awful lot of uh, took an awful lot of criticism for for depicting aristocrats in a favorable light, because you should just be that, you know, post-World War II, uh, class war was, you know, you have to just attack the rich. So a, a novel which actually treated the rich uh, with sympathy was, was itself something which did not get much sympathy. Um, but it, as with all great novels, the real test, I always say, you know, you canonize books the same way you canonize saints. Um, you, you don't do it during the life of the author. Um, so, you know, a, a great work uh, needs to age like a great, great uh, wine. So really, a uh, good rule of thumb would be certainly not, not, not less than 50 years after publication. Um, uh, now, that the British adapt TV adaptation was only, uh, I meant something good, 35 years after publication. Um, but uh, but generally speaking, a great work you know stands the test of time, and, and Bryce and the Visitor stood the test of time. And you look at how many. There's a very interesting. You've got nothing nothing better to do, and I'm sure you all have. If you were to go through, you know, what were the best selling books, top ten best selling books of every single year since say 1900, for the sake of it, uh, and see which of them are actually still being read today, and then analyze what is it about those books. Uh, that means that they have remained relevant and, and, and perennial, as opposed to the others, which were probably uh, very uh, up to date. And as, as C.S. Lewis says, you know, that, that, that fashions are always coming and going, but mostly going. So if something's up to date, it's going to be out of date. So it, you know, that's the point, is that what Bryce said deals with uh, are questions which are perennial, the, the eternal. Um, of course, there are aspects of it, like the 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 English aristocracy manor houses that it's largely passed away. But that, I mean that that's that's that in terms of philosophy, that's the accidental aspect, not the substantial aspect. That's why Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility are as relevant today as they were then, even though of course we don't live in the same sort of culture that uh, Jane Elliott's Jane Austen's heroes and Elliots, yeah, heroes and Elliots. <laughs> Heroes and heroines live in. <laughs> Too much talk of the wasteland. <laughs> got, got edit, edit on the mind. Normally I say Shakespeare when I'm talking about uh, Tolkien or Tolkien when I'm talking about Shakespeare. That's my usual profile. <laughs> um, Rachel, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? So uh, what, uh, having read all of Woe's work at this point, or at least all of his major novels, hey! scratch that not his war trilogy i'm getting around to that um but having read all of his pre-world war ii works this is very very different and i think you can see progression and actually his novel before this handful of dust was not well received by the church surprisingly enough so how do we put this in the canon of all of his work and kind of see the bigger picture of him going through the spiritual journey because he came to the church fairly late uh, well, he didn't come to the church late. He was received in 1930 when he was 26 years old, uh, in the midst of the breakup of his first marriage, uh, halfway through. Cradle, one of cradle Wilder. Catholic prejudice. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I, I actually he, uh, he was 26. He beat me. I was I was 28 when I became a Catholic, which believe me was a long time ago now. Um, so, uh, but yes, you're very you're correct. Bright's head uh, is evening wars coming of age. Uh, it's when he uh, attains the level of depth, profundity, maturity, which is not present in the early novels. Handful of Dust, I think, is the best of the rest um, of the pre pre war novels. Um, but they, yeah, they're, 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 he's not so playing for laughs, but it, he, he's, he, it's a rambunctious satire. His earlier books are rambunctious satires where he satirizes modernity from a traditional oriented perspective. Um, but playing for laughs. Uh, Ian Bryce said he's not playing for laughs, but if you, if those of you that haven't read earlier Evening War, um, the, the wonderful scene when Charles returns home to his father and his father's 
sadism in trying to make his son as uncomfortable as possible the party he organizes um uh is hilarious and so we we, we we see what war can do if he, if he wants to be funny but of course that uh, 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 and and it fits in beautifully here um within within the context of the novel uh but it, that's not what the novel's about where, but it does give us an idea of how funny he can be if he wants to be he's he's a very yeah his his satires are, are, are that, that, that the most important that, well the reason they're popular is because they're funny. The, the, the reason this is popular is not because it's funny. He ran with kind of a wild crowd when he was young. I mean, he had some really interesting friends that some of them are not quite as famous as him, but you would recognize their names. But, but he was a bright young thing and was smoking, drinking, partying with all the young aristocratic, like two of his best friends are who are the Mitford sisters. I don't know that he kept up the relationship with one after she was arrested during the war, but. Yeah, this, I just told this, by the way, I, I commented upon that. This edition does not have his disclaimer at the beginning, I can see, uh, which is very surprising is the case. It's dedicated to his wife, but the disclaimer is, uh, I am not I, you are not he, etc. Um, and I mean, my, my temptation is to suggest that he protesteth too loudly. Um, the, the point is that, 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 that Charles is exactly the same age as War, uh, that Charles goes to Oxford exactly the same time that War went to Oxford. Now, to be fair, a novelist has to draw on his experience. He has to write about what he knows about, right? Um, but uh, the, the, the basically, uh, the young evening War uh was more absolutely more riotous than Charles Ryder um you know he 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 was hedonistic uh drunk um sexually promiscuous uh but completely not the unhappy uh be, and I would say that, that, that that's that's the whole thing but uh, we should say because <laughs> right that he chose that lifestyle and it made him unhappy and and so you know uh, it, it's a, it's a recoil from you know a, a, Again, very briefly, one of my favorite novels I'm not recommending you read, uh, I, I could have got fired for teaching it once at undergraduate level, is a novel called Arabeau by Joris Cole Huisman, a French decadent novelist. And, and, and that, the whole point about that novel is the protagonist is so stinking rich with absolutely no commitments to anybody. There's no parents, no children, no wife, no any, anybody. And uh, he so, has so much money, he can indulge every single one of his sensual appetites and does. And at the end of the novel, uh, there's a creed occurs, there's a cry from the heart to a God he doesn't even know exists, but help. And the whole point of that novel is, look, if you could do exactly what you wanted all the time and, and, and there, were, there was no, uh, no, uh, uh, no consequences, you know, would, would that make you happy? No, it wouldn't. It'd make you miserable. And Huisman's becomes a Catholic. In fact, Huisman's very similar to, uh, to Sebastian. He becomes a Catholic. He wants to enter a monastery, but he's not good enough. So he sort of is a hanger on at the edge of a monastery, exactly like Sebastian is. Whether that's a connection, I don't know. But great question. Yeah, thank you. Connor's asking about the motto, et in Arcadia ego. Is that a reference to something. Can you speak a little bit more about that motto and what it means? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've forgotten. I, I, I think, and I could be wrong, it comes from Virgil. Uh, um, but uh, someone could probably Google and, get, and tell me if I'm right or wrong very quickly, probably. But um, it, it's, it's classical. Uh, and it goes back to that sort of time, to the time of, of Virgil. And, and it basically, it was a time when, you know, there, there, there was this, this uh, which is, again, this is perennial. What's better, the life of the city or the life of the country, the life of the peasant or the life, life of the citizen, right? Uh, and, and it's this uh, I, pastoral idyll, right? That, 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 that the country life, I mean, Tolkien does it with the Shire, you know, that you, you, you find this, this perfect, idyllic lifestyle. So Acadia, Acadia is that, and I think it goes back to classical Rome, but I've forgotten who first wrote it and where the, states, the statement comes from. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we'll end with this question, which a number of people are writing in asking about Lady Marchman. Um, can you speak a little bit more about her? A lot of people want to know 
does the author seem to think negatively of her? Um, what what would you say about her? Well, you know, as, uh, the, the the question, Lady Marshmain, uh, innocent or guilty, and give the case for the prosecution, the case of the defence, and then sum up as the judge and pass a verdict, um, is something that we can't really. I'm suggesting we can't really answer until we've looked at the whole book. So it would be a spoiler for me to start doing too much. One thing I would say is that uh, the way that we judge Lady Marshmain is like a magic mirror. I think it says a great deal more about us than it says about her. Um, so uh, and, and on that enigmatic note, I'm going to say no more until we talk more about her, because we've hardly seen her. I think it would be uh, jumping the gun for me to say too much at this point. People have to come back for the second and third session that had all to be revealed. That sounds great. On that note, is there anything that we should be keeping an eye out for as we read book two? Uh, well, I mean, the perennial issue, the two, the two perennial questions, the most important thing is the supernatural dimension, right? The, the place of providence in the story. Uh, where is God in this? Well, there's lots of people who believe in God, lots of people that wish they didn't, and, and many that don't. <laughs> uh, but where is God, right? The real God, where is he in this novel? Is he is he to be seen and in what way? So that's the key all the way through the novel. And, and, and I want you to keep your eye on Lady Marshman. I want you to actually, I want you to look at her. I want you to look at the evidence. I want you to form your own opinions. Uh, and then when you pass judgment on her, I'll pass judgment on you. <laughs> That's great. Mayor Cooper, Mayor Cooper, Mayor Maxima Cooper. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Joseph Pierce, for being with us this evening. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. See you in a few weeks for part two. <laughs>